All right, and welcome to episode 10 of Modern Prescription. My name is Dr. Deepak Dugar. I'm a facial plastic surgeon here in Beverly Hills. And I'm Dr. Jeff Toll. I'm a concierge internal medicine doctor. And today we're talking about some great stuff. Can you believe this is 10 of these already? 10 of these. It took us 10 episodes to mention someone getting cement in their butt. (laughs) Cement in the booty. How is that possible? (laughs) Yeah, we're talking about booty cement. And we're talking about uh, Freezing freezing, freezing your own blood. Well, I came up with this live on the air, but freezing <laughs> someone's but getting someone's blood. Yeah, tr- talking about transfusion. You, you got to learn what a blood boy is on today's episode if you yes. didn't know. Yeah, if you don't have, you know, a lot of people have chefs, a lot of people have maids. If you don't have a blood boy, you're way <laughs> behind, way behind. Yeah, it's like this is taking personal training to a new level. Yes, yes. Blood boys. And we're going to talk about our own personal approaches to maintaining and uh, taming our emotions. That's right. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. So uh, enjoy the Enjoy the episode. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. And welcome back to episode 10 of Modern Prescription. My name is Dr. Deepak Dugar. And I'm Dr. Jeff Toll. And today we're just going to dig right into it. So we're talking about some cool stuff today. Some sad stuff, some happy stuff. Just a lot of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a lot of stuff. So tell me what's going on with uh, your boy, uh, President Trump's announcement of convalescent plasma. Is gotcha. that like, are we all cured now? So I've Saved? had about 30 to 70 texts and or calls <laughs> in the last few days. <laughs> I'll get back to this, but I was in Yosemite this weekend. and Oh, I, yeah. I got back from a hike with like dozens of text all about this convalescent plasma. Isn't that the best thing in the middle of a beautiful hike in Yosemite? So basically <laughs> what the president uh, offered as like a breakthrough is something that we've already been doing, you know, since really the beginning. So a classic treatment for really any infection or viral infection is you take someone uh, who survived that disease and you know they're making antibodies for the disease mm-hmm. um, and you can actually uh, pool those antibodies from different people and then now you have a plasma that you could treat patients with. This was how, if anyone saw the movie, uh, what was that uh, Dustin Hoffman movie from the oh, 90s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Outbreak. 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 Yes. A, a great movie. Yeah. Probably one of the reasons I became a doctor was I loved Outbreak. <laughs> anyway, that was the, the, they found a monkey who had survived yeah. and the monkey had some plasma and that was there. So that was the end. Right. Unfortunately, a couple things. So number one is, it's, we think it's helpful. There has been no randomized control trial to determine how helpful. Um, plasma, anytime you give someone plasma, you run the risk of um, like a serum sickness where because, you know, we're, we're all familiar with different blood types. Right. But there are also different markers in the blood and in the plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood, that can cause a reaction. So you could cause a potentially deadly or very sick reaction. So, so far we've really only been using this convalescent plasma in people who are very sick, like right. hospitalized sick or even very sick for hospitalized. Like on the ventilator. Or at least getting close to the ventilator. Okay. Um, it, this is not something we're trying with someone sitting on their couch with a mm-hmm. mild fever, right? which is really what we need a solution for. So, so a lot of these treatments like, you know, the antivirals that we're using, the dexamethasone, we're talking about improving survival, you know, a a 30% improvement, 20% improvement for people who are the sickest of the sick. We're not talking about, you know, something that we have for the flu, which is an antiviral pill that has very little side effects that you can take even preventatively if you've had a contact. That we don't have yet. So this is not really a game changer. Mm-hmm. This is something already, I think 70,000 people in the Uf- ha- U.S. have had it already. Oh, wow. And so it, this is not something that really pushes the Have had the you. convalescent plasma? Have, have used convalescent wow. plasma. So this is, you know, this is something that is a treatment that's been used and it's somewhat effective probably. Mm-hmm. We don't have a huge trial to know exactly how effective. So the effective. 30, 30%, 35% success that Donald Trump said is not... Valid, maybe. So, but keep in mind, this is this means out of the, you know, out of the sickest of the sick, if you improve survival or getting off the ventilator, you know, in one out of three people, that's it's it's significant. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it it may not be as significant as we think it could Because they may have gotten better anyway. They may have gotten better anyway. And so right. it's hard to tell. There's no randomized, you know, where you take each group and you see who does better and you actually do real statistics. Right. So we don't specifically know the exact amount. It, right. it, it seems like people aren't getting sick from it, which is good. Um, but even that we can't really prove without a trial. It sounds very futuristic. You, know, you take your you take someone's blood and you strain it to get the beautiful parts of it and you stick it in someone else and it what's, cures you. What's interesting is this is the exact opposite. This is the old school way. So this mm. is like... You know, when the the when we cured smallpox, for example, they would give people um, cowpox on purpose, which wow. was a similar disease, and then they would take the antibodies from that and give people the plasma from the cowpox patients. Wow. So this was like as old school as it gets. Yeah. Um, for a new disease, this is the best we have. One of the best things we have, but not really a game changer for your average person. What we need, what we do, the two things we need or three things we need that we don't have are number one, we need faster, quicker testing with that's cheaper. Yeah, with rapid turnaround of results. With, sure, ch- turnaround to results that's actionable. So you yes. find out, you have it, you know immediately, you don't give it to anyone else. Right. You're quarantined, you have time to contact, trace everyone else immediately to tell them also not to be around other people not to get other people sick. That's how yeah. you s- snuff it out. That Very smart. Yes. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Quicker turnaround time on the test. And then safe test, I've been mean safe uh, treatments to take when you think you've been exposed. So a post-exposure prophylaxis like we have for the flu, Tamiflu, mm-hmm. there's some newer ones too. But if you think you may have been exposed, you take this prophylaxis and it gives you some protection against having a full-blown case. And for Tamiflu that you brought up, do you recommend for your older patients to take Tamiflu? So I don't recommend anyone just takes Tamiflu like throughout the winter. Yeah. But if, let's say, um, you are elderly or even not elderly, let's say you're Mm -hmm. 45 Mm -hmm. and your teenage kid has the flu and tested positive for the flu and you don't have symptoms yet, yeah, you can take the prophylaxis. It'll shorten the course for you yeah. and you'll be less likely to give it to someone else because your course will be easier and shorter. Yeah, and they so, consult their physician and discuss if that's a good yeah, option. Yeah, so all of these medications, even Tamiflu, have side effects, have potential yeah. interactions with other medications people are taking. Right. And so you should always, you know, these are prescription drugs. You need to talk to your doctor. You can't just get them. Um, but we need something akin to that for for COVID, which, yeah. we don't, which we don't have. The convalescent plasma is interesting because there's also this new wave of people in regenerative medicine who are, who are trying to bring it back again, the old school, yeah. what's called um, plasmapheresis or um, like, it's basically like biohacking where they take blood from a younger specimen and then they put it into an older person. And the concept is that you're using the growth factors from the plasma of the youthful person and rejuvenating the cells and tissues of the older person who uh, no longer has that youthful plasma. Um, so it's, it's funny because there, there's actually a company that was doing this on the East Coast, I think. I'm not sure if they're still doing it, if they were shut down or not. Yeah. Um, but basically it's taking uh, young people's plasma and putting it into of older unrelated patients. people. Of unrelated people. And so they just cross-testing it. So basically it's old rich people People. Right. Like there's this right. show on HBO called Silicon Valley yeah. where they made fun of this um, supposedly they're the character who's supposed to be like Peter Thiel. Yeah. Um, they were you know mimicking that he has what's called blood boys, and so he has these young like twenty two gotcha, year old gotcha. super handsome young guys. I can imagine what a blood boy is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and literally he's in the middle of a meeting, and <laughs> the blood boy runs in, and they <laughs> attach his blood, and they attach his blood. They have IVs, and it's right. just circulating the blood, right. which is obviously uh, an oversimplified version of it. Right. The, the concept being to take the blood from like young 22 year old who donates it, you get the plasma out and then you as a 65 year old get infused that young person's plasma and it's supposed to rejuvenate all the cells and tissues of the body. I would see, I would need to see more proof of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it sounds great. Yeah. I even want to do it almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think <laughs> you, more likely you're going to cause a reaction than get any benefit from that. Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's going to be interesting seeing all this regenerative medicine stuff. Like, because the problem with the, the cool thing about regen, anyone listening, if you read a doctor's website who does regenerative medicine, mm-hmm. I have I, doctor colleagues that do it, that they believe in it. They know the, the very minuscule research that is out on some of these things. Yeah. The problem is these things sound amazing. 
but when there's very little true scientific basis to it, mm-hmm. there, there's a reason. The reason these are not FDA approved is not because they are trying to keep you from something. Yeah, yeah. It's that, at least in, in America, it's different in other countries. Mm-hmm. In America, there's some process, or at least there used to be some process for which things are guaranteed to be safe. That's right. the FDA stamp is that it's safe enough to do. Right. During the COVID era, there's a lot of emergency youth use authorization, meaning because we are in a crazy pandemic, we're going to emergency authorize this now, even though it hasn't gone through the full FDA process. Right, right, so a right. lot of the COVID tests, that's what we're using right now because it's the best we have. Right. Um, but yeah, in not, other not areas, everyone needs a blood boy, though. In other areas, so blood boys have not been <laughs> FDA approved yet. Yeah. So no blood because boys the yet. thing is, blood boys could be bad for you. We don't know. Right, right. Or it could cause some other autoimmune problem later on by being exposed to plasma. We don't really know. Yeah. It needs to be, or some other thing I haven't thought of sitting here, but it all needs to be tested. Yeah, totally. And so when you go to these regenerative doctors, whatever they're doing, some have some more evidence than others. Stem cells, PRTP have evidence. Other treatments, you know, have probably less. Um, and so if they're doing things with no evidence... It's, it's interesting that the people who are super skeptical of Western medicine and say, oh, you know, I would never take a antidepressant, for example, because I read the bottle and look at this list of side effects that it right, has. Right, right, right. What they don't realize is you have to be equally, if not more, skeptical of non-FDA approved things, even supplements sometimes, because mm-hmm. these have not gone through rigorous testing to have a list of side effects. Right. It's just someone offering you them. Right. And it's interesting, and so, on all the supplement bottles, if you look at the bottom, they all have the same sentence. And we it do says not, that, this is not treat, been, diagnose, or cure any disease. Yes, exactly. And that means and I have not, not tested by FDA. Correct. Yeah. And so it's interesting because I have patients who will not take a vaccine, mm-hmm. who will not take a blood pressure pill despite high blood pressure, but will take any supplement I offer right. without any question of you know, side effects or they, you know, natural, natural doctor. or right. and, stuff. and the it's so bizarre to me because if you just have a logical brain and just think about why, why would you prefer to take something that's not tested at, against at all? Right. Versus something that the has The reason been. the other thing has a list of side effects is because they made 10,000 <laughs> people take it and right. they wrote down every side effect. Every single side effect. That's what those side, what do you think? That's what those lists, that's the right. list. Right, so yeah. at the end of the commercial, when they say, and they're really fast, yes. voice, this can cause depression, <coughs> sleepiness, happiness, c- yes. kindness, sadness. Yes, and so what, one thing I find re- super interesting, and we, we keep coming back to this whole depression thing, um, one thing that I find interesting is when if you think about the disease being treated and mm-hmm. the effect that has on the list of side effects, so let's say you're picking anxiety or depression as the disease of which you're testing a population of 10,000 people, you, taking a medication for that. So the way a clinical trial works is we take 5,000 people with depression, 5,000 without. We give them all the pills, see if people get sick on each side. Then we take an even bigger group. The the, the next stage of the trials, you take 30,000 people with depression, all of them, and you give them all the medication and you screen for a benefit and side effects. Mm-hmm. So if you have a population, you've already self-picked depressed or anxious people you may right. have a much longer list of side Comorbidities, effects. Comorbidities, yes. Side effects, you know. Yes, so if you yes. take an anxious, so let's say Lexapro, you take a, a population of 30,000 anxious people, you may get side effects of headaches, sore throat, right. like because they're anxious, they're going right. to think they have side effects. Absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, that's a th- no, we it's weird that, to think about. But no, it's, but it's so true. We see that all the day in our practices. Like you have two patients who have the exact same problem, and one of them has so many more complaints. And you, the, the anxiety is real, yeah. and it can go through your body to throw so many things, like you know, pain, pressure. There's all types of ways yeah. that anxiety can be uh, shown. It's not right. just a psychological or mental right. thing. Sometimes, right. yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting the way that rege- regenerative medicine in general is going. And I think regenerative medicine slash cosmetics kind of have this weird taboo because there's a lot of like 
undo- undocumented and kind of just like voodoo treatments that are happening. And, you know, right. and I'm my whole thing is like I'm the plastic surgery yeah. police. Yeah. I like to like stomp yeah. down on people yeah. when I see them doing you all should. these fraudulent procedures and practices, um, especially like the med spas. I love my med spas. I love all the med spas out there except yeah. for the ones that are bad that yeah. I don't like you. Um, but there's so many med spas that just yeah. like try to just take advantage of young, impressionable people, and even older people. I see it all the time where I'll have this cute older lady who came to me and says, I spent $15,000 at this med spa for these treatments and I've seen no difference. And, you know, you just feel so bad for them when you feel like they were just bamboozled. There's totally bamboozled. And I feel like a lot Are, of regenerative you, medicine do you, is the same. Do you think in the, on the cosmetic side, is it that they don't know what they're doing? Is it that or are they using like actually fake products, like fake? I think they. I think there's this whole concept. So fake products is interesting because right now there's an article that just came out in Cincinnati. Twenty four thousand dollars worth of fake Botox was seized. Really? Um, by the customs. Yeah. Wow. And fake Botox, fake products. This is a real problem right now in America. You know, it doesn't matter where you go, what city you're in. There are fake products everywhere. Fake fillers, fake Botox, fake PDO threads, and they get them from weird places. They get them from. Mexico, China, all over the world, they're, they're selling these products. And do the, how does the doctor know or they just wouldn't know? Well, the doctor would know because they didn't buy it from a typical source. So gotcha. like, if I'm going to buy Botox, I'll buy it from Allergan. Um, you know, if I'm going to buy Dysport. you buy it directly from the manufacturer? All, 99% of physicians yeah. in America do. And, and it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, I don't know how they figured this out. It's kind of like um, bottom to top tier business strategy. But like Allergan figured out some way. I mean, they're a company that sells a drug, right? Their drug is called Botox. Yeah. Normally, if you're a company that sells a drug, you then contract with a pharmacy who then the doctor is right scripts yeah. for and the pharmacy dispenses medication, right? Right. Allergan and a lot of these cosmetic companies figured out the loophole where they don't do that. And so the doctors have to buy direct from them. There's no middlemen. So we buy it, directly from Allergan when we buy is that, Botox. Is that because it's not paid for by insurance? That's probably a good question. Is it not paid by insurance? But there's other medications that aren't paid by insurance sometimes that go to the pharmacy too. Um, but also it's not, to be used by the patient. It's supposed to be there, used I think for, so. I'm just doctor. thinking about in my practice. So there's mm-hmm. certain drugs where I order either from, I guess not really the company, from, from farm, I'll order it from pharmacy. Mostly pharmacies, right? Well, like things like, you know, B12 or lidocaine or there's like- You get those sometimes directly from the or from manufacturer? Like a, no, never really from the manufacturer. Yeah, see, that's yeah. the thing. Uh, Botox, we're literally buying from the manufacturer. Weird. It's really odd. Yeah. It's the only time I've ever heard of that. Yeah. It usually goes through some type of distributor. Right. You know, even if it's not a pharmacy. Yeah, this like is a big direct- distribution company. Yeah. That's where I get my yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But th- these guys are like Money Mayweather, and they, wow. <laughs> they kept every dollar. Wow. Um, but anyway, so most doctors, if they're buying, or, or buying Botox, Dysport, Javo, Xeomin, um, just to give everyone fair credit, uh, these are the four neuromodulators that are used for cosmetics. There are four uh, Botoxes? Four different Botoxes, yeah. Really? Botox, Dysport, made by a company called Galderma, Xeomin, and then there's a new one called Javo. Um, that's like the newest uh, kid on the block. And and Javo and name. Javo has the coolest name, but Javo is the baby and uh, is currently in a legal battle with Botox. They're how much each other. does that one Javo, Javo go for? for? It's funny. They all. Uh, how much does Javo go for? <laughs> 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 they all uh, are similar pricing, I would say. Generally speaking, consumers will probably pay the exact same. Doesn't matter which product your doctor's using: Botox, Dysport, Javo, Xeomin. But for the doctors, there can be advantageous uh, relationships sometimes behind why they use a product. So some of them have shorter onset. Some of them last longer. Some of them last shorter. Some of them kick in faster. Some of them kick in slower. Um, some of them are heavier. Like I find it, uh, tend to find that Botox is a little heavier than Dysport. So I feel like if you really want to freeze a face, it's easier to do that with Botox versus with Dysport. You have to really overdose to get a frozen face. Some people want that. Um, but then the other thing that I've noticed is that sometimes there's also um, relationships. Okay. So just like, you know, a certain store will carry certain brands, yeah. you know, like which are the best skincare brands. It's just, it's not yeah. necessarily what's at Nordstrom. It's just who's Nordstrom yeah. has relationships yeah. with. So some doctors have better relationships with Galderma. Some have better relationships with Allergan. So they carry those products, but they're all pretty similar. Um, but when you get to the nuances of it, um, as long as you're doing these standardized products, it's safe. The problem is a lot of the med spas out there don't, and they take the shortcuts. They'll buy random products from black market. Uh, they'll literally go online on YouTube, Google, and Amazon doesn't sell this stuff, thank God. But you can find it on YouTube and Google. eBay. Can, yeah, eBay sells all this kind of nonsense, and you can buy 
threads, fillers, Botox. You can buy like DIY, do it yourself, lip injection kits. You can buy That's right now insane. on eBay. Super scary. And people are like, comes with a needle, you stick it in your lip, you just squeeze it. And wow. it's like, you know, God bless you. Hope it, hope you wow. don't get into a major complication, wow. but super scary. I mean, I, I know a celebrity patient, uh, I can't mention her name, whose best friend had to be treated by a colleague of mine because she got cement injected into her behind. Uh, to get a butt oh, augmentation, wow. and her friend is a very wealthy celebrity. Cement, cement, yeah. Like so, so the, basically, the med spa buys cement, and then they mix it with water and dissolving factors to make it into like this liquid paste type thing. And then they literally injected cement in this girl's behind. This is somewhere in Houston, wow. Texas. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Really distressing. She had to have a terrible, terrible surgery uh, to remove it all, and even then, you know, scarred, disfigured the rest of her life. Wow. So really weird, shady stuff out there. And that's where I feel like regenerative medicine and cosmetics, you know, both amazing industries, but there are some weird snake charmers in both of those fields. Yeah, yeah. You know, like the oil salesman. And the interesting thing is uh, in in both of those fields, I have known of certain physicians who got sort of caught for what they did Mm -hmm, and had to go to Mexico or somewhere else to practice. Good for them. And they'll still find people who who will say, well, they, you know, they're the only one who knows about this stem cell right. treatment. And so, the F, you know, the American, you know, the deep state wouldn't let them <laughs> yeah. operate. You know, they wouldn't let right. them stay here in America. Yeah. So now they're all, they're only in Mexico City and they right. can cure yeah. diabetes and HIV. And right. All the other stuff. or whatever it is they or decided. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's just a shame, but I'm glad the consumers are generally getting smarter. And I think that the consumers understand um, when they're being sold to, you know, right. most, right. not right. all. And that's the sad part. And yeah. that's why FDA approval, like you said, is so important. I mean, it's just some, listen, it's not perfect. Like, Mm -hmm. do drugs have side effects? Ten years later, do we find out that, you know, certain antibiotics like Cipro can cause tendon problems? Right. And did we know that for a long time? Not really. Do we know it now? Better? So, will things slip through? Yes. But if you have no process at all, more things yeah, will slip through. Exactly, exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, the other thing I wanted to, we wanted to touch on today was uh, a new study came out from the CDC this week, and this is we want to bring our light-hearted modern prescription to this topic. Um, they said the CDC said that one in four young adults, so this is people age eighteen to twenty-four, okay, had contemplated suicide in the last thirty days. That's your lighthearted part? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about how we're going to make this a oh, lighthearted man. topic because that is a seriously crazy statistic. Is that because statistic. their college is canceled? No, they're just contributing to the pandemic in oh, general. Man. And, and they, they uh, polled about 5,500 people. Oh, wow. so, it so it wasn't like a, a real, small. Yeah, yeah. it's a real thing. And wow. out of the 5,500, one in four said that they contemplated suicide in the past 30 days. 30 days. Yeah. And this was all pulled the last week of June. So this is recent data and really sad and depressing. This is a rough year. It's a rough year. I I wonder what the percentage normally is. I think uh, it's not, definitely not that high. Um, Probably in that age range. I mean, that's one of the highest age ranges for suicide in general. Um, But I don't think it's going to ever be that high normally. So this is definitely bizarre, bizarre times. I mean, I keep talking about it every every week, but this is definitely the most the most times per day, every single day, where there's some conversation about depression, anxiety, or mm-hmm. what they're really for is that there for. So I think in medicine sometimes, because of the stigma of talking about mental health, yeah. someone will come for some other reason. Mm-hmm. So like my left hip's hurting, but like really when you get down to it, they're just like depressed and mm-hmm. that's what I find out. Yeah. Once. And or the left hip was nothing compared to their depression. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think what one thing I've found too is that a lot of people, we all have a habit of reacting. And so we, we emotionally uh, have stimuli that enter us, make us sad for whatever yeah. reason. And then we react yeah. rather than processing and acting. You know, processing yeah. meaning like absorbing the emotion, understanding the sadness or the anger or the frustration, letting it simmer, then logically analyzing pros and cons of what our decision-making tree could be, then deciding and acting rather than reacting. 
I mean, what I've always said is you you need some maintenance, preventative, like p- good mental health habits mm-hmm. in order to be able to do that. Yeah. Because it's too Agreed. hard otherwise. Agreed. If you're stressed and you're like running on and th- like your margin of sanity is so thin. Yes. Then when the bad thing happens, like that's all you had. You had, you had no space to let that ha- happen and let it happen and think about it. Right. Um, like they say, the straw that broke, broke the camel's yeah, back. Yeah, but you got you to gotta fix the back before yeah. one straw could break it. Right, right. What do yeah. you What do you like to do? So I, I've talked before about my meditation mm-hmm. habits. Um, this weekend, I actually decided to get away. I had a little, I had a, I took off Friday and off Thursday afternoon. So I went to Yosemite National Park. Wow. I, I, I drove, I left at like two o'clock on Thursday to get nice. the, so I could wake up in Yosemite. Yeah, beautiful. Friday, yeah. So got an extra day. Um, and just had a relaxing, my, like I said, my cell phone had no service. So even if I wanted to be thinking about work, <laughs> I, I couldn't be. Um, I had a doctor covering me over the weekend. Beautiful. I did some epic hiking and breathing fresh air. I saw some of the photos. They looked amazing. It was incredible. And uh, I wish I could have stayed another week. (laughs) But it was, no, but I mean, you know, I think uh, just testing your body, pushing yourself. I went on a really, a couple of really hard hikes that I was surprised actually we were able to do. Wow. Um, But I just felt great. You know, my legs are still sore today, but I think, it was like a weight lifted off, you know, just yeah. to let everything, just, it puts into perspective. I think for me, the n- nature is helpful mm-hmm. um, just to kind of get away from the city, get away from all the things that seem so important, like these little interactions of how did it go with that one patient or how did that one meeting go? Mm-hmm. And then you go away to like the most beautiful place on earth where the valley's gigantic and there's waterfalls and you just realize like how tiny we are and how right. insignificant these things should really <laughs> yeah. be to just kind of like, it's that maintenance, uh, you know, I think when, uh, when Ariane Celeste was on the show, she was yeah. talking about this maintenance yes. she does for her mental health, where even being pregnant during a pandemic, she's able to, because she, it's part of her day every for her. It's every day for right. other people. It's not every day, but it, right. it needs to be some days. Right. It needs to be some days. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I think for, for me personally, I have found that I am really in tune with my, like, like almost like, you know, all of us are focused on our egos. E- everyone gets confused with ego. Ego means um, self inflection, like self-thought. It doesn't mean you're egotistical. It doesn't mean you're confident. Uh, Being ego-driven means that you're hyper-focused on yourself and your thoughts. And I think that I've started to step out of that and kind of look at myself in a layer above and be able to see, oh, I'm frustrated right now. It's almost like I, I look yeah. at myself like with a smile. I'm like, oh, right. look at you, you little angry. Right. You're angry. Right. I can tell you're angry. <laughs> and, it, and it's so helpful to me because I'm able to say, oh yeah, I am being angry right now. And it doesn't mean I stop being angry all of a sudden. Sometimes I'm still angry yeah. or still frustrated, still annoyed, still sad. Right. But I can at least step out of my box and say, oh yeah, you're being sad right now. You're, you're getting a little sad. Look at that. It's getting a little sad. I love and that. it really helps me because it allows me two things. One, to understand that okay, I'm acknowledging this is happening. Mm-hmm. So I need to do something to get out of it or change it, mm-hmm. right? So it doesn't. I don't just let my emotions drive the ship because emotions should not be the captain. No. The captain has to be logic. And you know, the emotions can be on the deck partying, wearing swimsuits, but not driving the ship. Right. And so that's number one, I love it. It lets me regain control that, all right, I'm still the captain of this. Not my happiness, not my sadness, not my anger, yeah. not my frustration. And then number two, I love it because it allows me to slowly redirect my behavior. Because when you're, when you're emotional, if you're frustrated with somebody or you're upset or angry or sad, you act a certain way. Your behavior automatically you know, conforms to those emotions if the emotion's driving the ship. Right. But when you're able to step out of it, acknowledge the emotion, you can conform your behavior to what logic would have done and said rather than reacting. So it's about acting versus reacting. So I think that you've almost described mindfulness meditation. That's what it is. It's like you're getting out of your brain mm-hmm. and looking at yourself. Yeah. And then le- taking a moment to acknowledge the thoughts you're having but not let them yeah. be 
in control anymore. Yes, and, and that's exactly, yeah. it's, it's just, that's basically how you practice your that's meditation. That's mindfulness. Yeah. That's not the type I practice, but that's what a type of meditation, yeah. that's what yeah. it is. Maybe, maybe you would like it. Yeah, like, I think I'm I just going to keep telling you to do it. Yeah, I know, I know. We can tell you yeah, one episode I'm going to come in here and be like, guys, I've been meditating, it's amazing. Yeah, it'll change your life. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Change your life. The other thing, I, you know, because I think stress and um, depression are two different things. And I think Big people, time. yeah, I think a lot of people just associate them together. Like, well, I'm so, I'm so stressed. What do you expect me to feel? Well, those two separate things, you know, de-stressing and taking care of your mental health, totally separate topics. Um, well, they, I think they're the same strategies can help deal with both. But, right. Same strategies. Yeah. But two different problems like anxiety yeah. or depression or depression and bipolar. I think they're similar. But there are separate problems because stress can be relieved by going away for the weekend. Yep. Taking a break, not looking at your phone, not looking at your work, your calendar. But taking control of your emotions may not, you know, you could be just as angry or sad on this trip too, depending on your state of um, mind. I, I, I'm i going to fight you on that one. Yeah, tell I me. I will argue that the class, and this is the way that I see it, the classic way we tend to treat depression is talk to a therapist and mm -hmm. complain about your problems. Right, 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 and right. And it's the exact opposite way that I try to get my patients to deal with it. I, I think it, it's a time for action. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I agree, yeah. And so to me, going to kill somebody is a great treatment for your depression, actually. I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, you need to get to the realization that you don't want to feel that way anymore mm -hmm. and then do something about it. Right. That's so a good point. You, you, when someone sits in their, when, when they're in their depression and they just call their therapist once a week and they complain about, I'm sad and this happened to me and, you know, there terrible things happen, you know, yeah. spouse died, child, whatever. Yeah. Um, but th in order to get out of that, you have to do something. Sometimes right. it's medications will help you. Sometimes, you know, all sorts of other things can help, but I think the doing something is the underrated part of getting out of it. Hugely important. Yeah, I actually 100% agree with that statement. Yeah, the doing is so important. And the problem is people don't want to do because it's hard. It's, it's Doing's work. always hard. Doing's work. It's hard. Yeah, it's so much easier just to be like, oh, well, it should get better. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you find, I, I think this is going to be interesting, but when you operate, mm -hmm. are you completely free of you, your own brain during those hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I don't think about anything yeah. and, and I don't think about my personal problems. I don't yeah. think about work. I don't even think about work problems. Yeah. I don't even think about anything besides this moment yeah. because you're, it, and, I, and it's actually relaxing in a weird yep. way yep. Um, because you, you get, it's the only time I don't have access to my phone. My phone's not with me. Yeah. It's on silent and another, like, I, there's no emergency that trumps what I'm currently doing. Right. And that's one of the rare moments as a surgeon that you get that kind of peacefulness, you know? And I remember in residency, we do those 15 hour free flap cases, reconstruction things. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of cool. Like it was a peaceful day because you're just unbothered. Yeah. Nobody can mess with you because yeah. you're in, there's nothing more critical than a patient on the operating room table right. who needs your surgical skills. And so, yeah, that's honestly kind of a mindful moment for me, yeah. mindful hour for me yeah. each time I do a surgery. Yeah. And the patient gets absolute 100% dedicated focus. And I, I would, you know, like I always bring up the comparison, but it's very similar to an athlete. Like when LeBron yeah. James is playing basketball, it does not matter what argument he had with his wife last night or what his kids said to him that morning or yeah. what his managers and business partners are trying to steal from him. You know, it's, he just has to win, Yeah. you know? And so I think, uh, yeah, it's really actually a really cool part of my day. I would say is, is it that fast? It takes an hour for you to fix someone's change someone's whole life. In an hour? <laughs> Sometimes hour to an hour and a half on average for the type of surgeries I right, do. Right. Yeah. That's hour amazing. to an hour and a half. Yeah. Which is great because I can do three to four a day on average. And yeah. that's pretty much what I do three to four a day on my surgery days. Um, and it's really nice because you get to really see some cool changes. Changes. So after you do no, after you you change their life, then <laughs> then what happens? They come back after how long? Yeah, so they'll come back uh, in a week for me to take off the cast, and they'll okay. come back in about six weeks for me to reassess and make sure everything's healing well. And then that's it. And then they're what, on their way. Does it by six weeks? Is it like fully? You could tell what's going to be like. Or is yeah. there still some swelling? There's or? still some swelling, but generally I can tell what it's going to finally mold into. Um, and even then, there's some variations because the problem is tissues uh, not clay. The human clay, yeah. if I if we had that, would be amazing because I could set it 
and walk away and it would be perfect. But that's not how it works, right? We have tissue. Tissue's not awesome like that. Right. So it molds, it bends, it can pinch, it can twist. Yeah. And so what I tell all patients is that if you're looking for a perfect nose, I'm not the right surgeon. I'm just not the right guy. Well, who could do it perfect then? I don't know. Some surgeons say they can. and I Who think, can do the sparkle filter for that? I know, exactly. So there's some guy out there <laughs> putting glitter during the middle of the surgery just to make it perfect. But if, they, if they're looking for perfect, I'm not the right guy. But if they want natural, which means some naturality, some eccentricities, yeah. then I'm the right surgeon. And that's gotcha. the way I've always approached it. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think my practice is part of my happiness because I've found a really good ability to use my surgery time as like my meditation almost it makes total sense yeah it's really good i've never thought of it like that but i guess you're completely right that's what's that's my therapy there you go (laughs) surgery is my therapy it it makes total sense to me i i will you know used to play sports and i find um since the pandemic i play in a soccer league and even Mm -hmm. just the once a week um was amazing for me and since the pandemic obviously i can't play team sports yeah um, and I miss it tremendously, for sure. Because during that hour, you have no phone. I'm in the zone. You're in the zone. I'm just in my bo- just playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world ceases to exist. Right. I want to win. I'm very competitive. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but but the rest of the world is gone. It just stops for a few minutes or yeah. a few hours. No worries. No anything else. Yeah, I think that's hugely important. So stepping out of yourself, stepping out of your mind, mindfulness, as you yeah, called it, yeah. uh, super critical. I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. I've always been. And he's a little aggressive for a lot of people because yeah. um, his, his tact and style is very in your face. Yeah. Um, but it goes back to what you're saying. It's like, you know, to change your life, you have to take massive action is what his whole philosophy is. Like, you can't just be like, I want to be happier today. That doesn't no. do anything. No. You have to take massive action. You have to, you know, book personal trainers and, you know, start a whole new diet. And you have to, you know, start hanging out with new friends and be around new people and watch new content. And yeah. if you can't just keep absorbing the same things every day and watching yeah. the same TV that makes you feel crappy and eating the foods that make you feel full and bloated, you can't just keep consuming that and not expect to have uh, and expect a different outcome. If you want a different outcome, you got to do yeah. different things. You know, I to circle back to this thing about the teenagers being d- depressed. Yeah, I think one of the issues is that with social media is that the algorithm feeds you back what you're looking searching. At. Yes, and so, so true. And so, if you start looking, like let's say they're looking at you know someone like these really good looking people on TikTok or whatever mm-hmm. that are cool and have friends and blah blah blah, and they're the depressed like not cool one. And yeah. You know, all they're seeing is just feeding that same. Could not agree more. And that goes to my modern prescription for today that I think everyone should take this challenge right now. Pull out your phone, go on your Instagram and TikTok and unfollow or mute. Mute is the kosher way of doing it. Then no one will get mad at you. 10 or 15 people that you just don't give a shit about looking at their content all day because we spend so much time absorbing people's content that makes us feel bad. Just mute it. You can literally click on Instagram, anyone's page, and you can mute their stories or posts or both. I have hundreds of people muted and I still follow you all and I love you all, but you're muted. And I just do that because it gives me mental clarity. When I log into my Instagram, it's pure. It's awesome. I don't have any of the competitive energy. I don't have any of this like... Anything that makes me feel weird, I just mute it immediately. That's fantastic advice, and I'm going to steal it and tell people. <laughs> yeah, Great. it really works. Yeah. It really does yeah. work. Uh, it creates a safe space for you because there's no reason that Instagram can't be a positive environment. Yeah. But, but you have to take some action. You got to right. do something about it. Because right. like you said, algorithm algorithmically, Instagram is going to feed you what you keep looking at. So if you're looking at things that make you feel bad, it's yeah. going to keep showing it to you. Right. Like if you wanted to date someone and they didn't like you and said no, but you yes. follow them, if you were DMing them and it didn't work out, it's still coming up on your feed. Exactly. You gotta unfollow. You gotta unfollow or just mute. Just them. mute. Yeah, mute's the kosher way yeah. of doing it. If you don't want to let them know. Right. Yeah, and I, I love like that it. Instagram put that tool in because it's just so yeah. helpful. No, it makes total sense. Yeah. Let's just mute. Just mute. mute everything except this show because this show is providing. Valuable. The opposite. The valuable, valuable positivity. (laughs) I agree. And (laughs) share with your friends. And um, we're glad we could educate a little bit on the uh, ways to combat depression from our perspective. And uh, don't run out and get a blood boy. 
I think we should, should we test Blood Boy? Do we have any volunteers? <laughs> if you, if you want, want to. a volunteer yeah. to be, to either be a Blood Boy or receive blood from a bud, Blood Boy. I think a lot of billionaires are down for Blood Boys. A lot yeah, of billionaires are down. We're going to need a very good lawyer to write the contracts <laughs> yeah. for this. And then we can test it out. I know yeah. some regenerative medicine doctors who I'm sure would, would be willing to try. Uh, we just need a bunch of like 22 year old looking Jeff Tolls. <laughs> everyone, everyone wants your blood when you were 22. I should have saved my blood from that time. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like saving eggs. That, see, that makes girls. more sense. Right. If you were to tell me people save their own blood, now we're on to something. Ooh. See, we should just be coming up with Ooh. new treatments while we're live on the That's show. That's actually a really smart idea. So you save your own blood because when you're in your 20s and you bank it. Yeah, if you bank your own blood, you're not going to have reactions to it because of it's course. your own blood. Yeah, of course. Um, and you would be saving your own. That, that's a great idea. How Maybe you, I should save my COVID antibodies right now while I have them for myself. I have my own pl- convalescent plasma. Well, the, it's a great, great point. The question is, how long would you be able to store it? Because plasma usually, I think, is a one-year shelf life. Why can't you freeze it? Yeah, I guess we'd have, we'd have to look into this. All right. Well, I know when I know when someone is bleeding out in the ICU and mm-hmm. we have to give them fresh f- frozen plasma yeah. to give them back the mm-hmm. coag factors. It's frozen when it comes up to the unit. Right, right, right. But I think plasma has a one-year shelf life. Is oh, one or tw- yeah, 12 to 24 months, and then they throw it away. And so that's where uh, this guy who was doing this company that I was talking about at the yeah. beginning, the, the Plasma Phoresis Company, yeah. he was, uh, basically what he did is he made a deal with a couple of blood banks because they have to literally throw out their plasma after yeah. 12 to 24 months. They're not allowed to keep it longer. Okay. And so then instead of throwing it away, he bought it from them. And the blood bank said, great, it's win-win. So what he did is he took all the plasma that were from people aged 18 to 22. Yes. And uh, he just took that young plasma. And they, based on the blood type, would then distribute it into his rich patients who wanted to get the young blood to uh, revive You realize themselves. at least 50 to 100 people listening to this right now are going to try to get this blood down. You can't physically do this. It's, it's not physically uh, out there. It's just there's one company was and he got so shut so down. So they got shut down. Shut down. Yeah, got shut down. Was yeah. it shut down because it was old blood? No, it was shut down because I think the government wasn't ready to like look yeah. into this yet. Like literally no one is doing it. He was just a little too ahead of his time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of these types of things. So, um, the for example, the so the plasma is the liquid part of the blood, mm-hmm. but then there's also the the other part, which is the superdine, the white stuff. Yeah, which has the cells in it. Right. Um, and there's a lot of things about taking, let's say, the white cells out. So not just the antibodies, but you can actually take the white cells. Mm-hmm. Theoretically, if it was your own blood, you definitely could do it. Yeah, that's true. But the, they have reactions if you give it to. The reason we give the plasma as opposed to the cells is because the cells have markers. Like the red cells have right. blood type. Right. The white cells also have markers on it. Right, right, right. So it's less, you're more likely to have a reaction right. to someone else's cells. Right. So oh, they're, they're, called leuko, factors. they're called leuko reduced when you give red cells, they take out the white cells to reduce right. it. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's all sorts of these blood giving things. So this podcast may be us creating a super company. I like giving your your own blood back. I like that idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, let's look into this more. We're going to continue. Uh, I wish I educating had you guys on what we find year, out. Twenty two year old of my own blood would have been great right now. Ah, oh, just to get yourself like a little boost in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> a little little shot well, of your own how, blood. I don't know. With like the hormones, stay good. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know how I would feel at this age having 22-year-old testosterone. We'll have to go back and listen Levels. to our episode on growth hormone. Maybe we mix it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, great episode. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and share the share the show. Yes. Like, just like the show on on uh, Spotify and yeah. Apple and everywhere else. Absolutely. And, uh, share us. And if you like to watch us and you want to see what we look like, feel free to go on YouTube. We're here. We're sitting right here and in front of you. I always forget to look at the camera, but we're here. <laughs> and then also, um, if you have questions you want us to answer, people do, and then I forget to do it. But at this time. Yeah. I think we should this do a couple time. questions. Yeah, let's do it. For episode submit, 11. Submit, it's going to be submit a new your questions. Uh, thing. For episode 11, submit your questions. Tell us what you want us to talk about and give us some uh, of your own personal medical things that you want us to discuss. We'll be happy to do it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.